Hey again, it's lesson 6.3. How do economic decisions about scarcity, supply and demand, and competition affect individuals and groups? I'm drinking a Tim Hortons coffee right now uh, in my reusable uh, coffee cup thing here. I really wanted a Starbucks. I usually stop uh, and get a Starbucks before I do these videos, but the line was way too long. So I went to Tim's instead. And we're gonna talk about that in this lesson, plus a few other things. So stick around and let's learn something. All right, we are well on our way into chapter six. Welcome to lesson 6.3, how do economic decisions about scarcity, supply and demand and competition affect individuals and groups? Uh, we talked about scarcity in the last lesson and today let's head over to supply and demand. Uh, we can see that we've got in green, we've got the supply given to us by the producers. Consumers in the middle in this orangey color is uh, demanding a product. And then in the pink, we've got price. So we're gonna start here, it says, with a state of equilibrium. In a state of equilibrium, the supply of a product can meet the demand for a product at any particular price. Now, if demand for a product increases, that means people, more and more people are wanting to buy this product, which means the consumers are buying so much that the supply that's in stock, let's say, for example, uh, the availability of that product is going to drop. So whatever product remains is going to drive the price up because consumers are competing for that limited amount of product that is available. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Front row concert tickets, they are going to be more expensive than let's say upper bowl seats for, for a concert and they will be able to be resold at a much higher price. Think of going away on a long weekend. Gasoline obviously is going to be much more expensive because more people are going to be traveling on a long weekend. Anything that's considered to be a limited edition uh, item. Um, a couple of years ago, Shopkins was the big like toy for children and those limited editions, those drove the prices up. Flowers on Valentine's Day, obviously. The It toy, the In toy for Christmas. Okay, um, or for those of us that go camping, if you ever forget something and you need to go to the camp store and you need to buy something like ketchup, for example, oh my goodness, that is going to be so much more expensive than uh, what it would cost, let's say, at your regular grocery store that you go to. But if you really want it, the demand is there, well, then you are going to pay for it. And the last example I have here, you can see these are the um, whatever iPhones these are going to be when I Googled this, I don't know what iPhone number I put in. Uh, this is past number 13. Uh, but you can see when something new comes out, it is going to be much more expensive. Uh, for example, the original Xbox, when the original Xbox came out, I think it retailed for like, I don't know, 300 Canadian. And it was going online on eBay for $10,000. And the same thing happened with uh, PlayStation as well. So this drives the price higher. So what happens actually then when the price goes up? Well, when the price goes up, fewer people are going to be able to buy it. They won't be able to afford buying it. That's going to then bring the demand for that product down. And if the, the, if the demand decreases, then what will happen is the supply of that product is going to increase eventually. Now, some examples of that are going to be uh, any kind of shoes, popular shoes that have been out for quite some time. Um, originally, they may have cost $200 and people will go out and they will buy them. But after about six months, when the styles begin to change, people are not willing to buy them. So the demand is going to go down. The supply of those shoes, the stock is going to remain high and therefore the price is going to uh, eventually have to come down to again meet the meet the demand in the bottom right here i have a fidget spinner if you remember fidget spinners at all um, they used to go for 
quite a pretty penny. So years ago, you could get a fidget spinner for about $20, but now today, nobody wants fidget spinners. Uh, and if you do, there definitely isn't going to be that much of a demand for them. And that's going to um, uh, eventually drive that price down because there's going to be an increased supply. When you have an increased supply, there's more of that product available. And to sell that, we are going to have to uh, reduce the price. And if you reduce the price low enough, that'll encourage consumers to buy that supply. Now, an example of that are your sales. Anytime that something goes on sale, now you know why. Uh, the item that they have in stock, there's too much of it in stock. And at the price that they're wanting to sell that, there's not enough demand. So you lower the demand and people are now willing to pay for it. Like those shoes in the previous example. Six months ago, they may have been $200, but now people are not uh, wanting those shoes. Maybe they're out of fashion and whatnot. So the price of those shoes will decrease. They will go on sale for, let's say, about $100. And now we've got equilibrium that is um, that is restored at that lower price. Now, sometimes it says here, you can see here, that uh, sales are done on purpose because it will bring more people into the store and they will buy that product at a lower cost, but they'll buy more of that product. They'll rely on volume sales. That's how like Costco works. Uh, you can see like this is a picture here. This is Black uh, Friday or this might be Boxing Day. I'm not 100% sure. But these sales these days are going to be bringing people in to buy that that stock that is available at that equilibrium price. When the supply meets the demand of the consumers at a reasonable price. And now that's the this is going to bring us to competition. Because consumers, you and me, we are consumers, we're looking for the best quality product at the most reasonable price. And this is going to cause competition between companies that provide similar types of services, or similar types of products, they're going to be making a better product with less expensive goods. Now this ultimately is good for consumers, because it means that better quality is going to have uh, more variety of products and ultimately will have cheaper prices too. Now this is not just good for consumers, this is also good for producers too, because it forces them to be very innovative and it forces them to be efficient. So like your rivals here, we've got Coke and Pepsi, we've got Microsoft and Apple, but we could also include Samsung there. If it wasn't for Apple's iPhone, then you wouldn't have those Android devices. And if you didn't have these uh, top of the line, innovative Android devices, you wouldn't have these new iPhones coming out. Uh, the coffee wars of uh, nationally, we've got the Tim Hortons, Starbucks and second cup. And then our fast food restaurants, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, a and there's a lot more competition there. But competition equals uh, a good quality of life for some consumers. So I want to take a look at the coffee wars that exist. And here we've got Tim Hortons versus Starbucks. In the Edmonton area, we have about 103 locations, and we have 76 Starbucks locations. And both provide coffee, both are in competition with each other. But the coffee obviously is going to be different. And it, if it will affect your quality of life in the long run. So what I've done here is um, I've taken their most popular drinks. So at Tim Hortons, the most popular drink is a medium double double and is going for $1.76. The most popular drink at Starbucks is a vanilla latte, and it's going for $4.75. Now let's imagine that uh, a working adult uh, goes to purchase coffee on their way to work approximately 18 times a month. Well, at Tim Hortons, you're spending 31.68 a month. And at Starbucks, you're spending 85.50 a month. Now you multiply that by 12 years, your coffee total at Tim Hortons is going to be $380.16. Whereas your coffee total at Starbucks will be $1,026. Even that's a difference of $645 and 84 cents. Now over the course of the year, as a consumer, what could you do with that $645 and 84 cents if you choose to buy your coffee from Tim Hortons as opposed to uh, going to Starbucks? Now realistically, 
People will go to Tim Hortons, they'll go to Starbucks, they'll go to Second Cup, they'll go to independent coffee shops. But this is just an example of um, what the competition does. So Tim Hortons, um, they sell their coffee at a, at a cheaper price, hoping to get more people in. And then Starbucks it will sell at a more expensive price and they'll, they'll change up their stores a little bit to add to a different experience, if you will. This is an example of a coffee show and this is competition. But what if you don't have a competition? What's that called if you don't have competition? If you've got nobody to compete against, if you control the market, that means you've got a monopoly. When one producer controls all the supply of a product or a service, consumers, they have no choice because there's only one seller and the seller can choose whatever price they want. There are laws that exist today to prevent uh, monopolies from occurring or will try to intervene and stop monopolies from occurring. I've got a picture here of a Time magazine cover. This was when um, Bill Gates and Microsoft, they had a monopoly on Windows products and you could use any browser that you wished, but they knew that the majority of the market back in the probably mid 1990s, uh, even late 1990s was all Windows based, I think 95%, like I said, so they controlled the entire market. So they were forcing people to use Windows Explorer, other browsers did exist, uh, but they didn't run as well as Windows Explorer and um, some antitrust laws and some legislation and some court rulings came into play. And they busted uh, Bill's monopoly there. So competition, you need to have competition. Competition uh, leads to innovation and leads to efficiency. And this is all part of just our economy. We are a mixed economy and all of our businesses and our economy go through something called the business cycle. And this is just like a roller coaster, ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs, periods of prosperity, periods of recession. And this is done through a country's industrial growth or our production of an economy. And there are four main phases uh, in the business cycle. We've got uh, depression and recovery, a prosperity, and then we've got recession. But there's also in the green there something called regulation. And that is something that is done um, when a government intervenes, moves to the left to do something, which we'll talk about. So the four phases. First is a depression. This is the lowest point of the business cycle. Usually this is... Um, this will have high unemployment and very little economic activity. Okay. After a depression, eventually everybody gets out of a depression in terms of the economy and we are into a recovery. This is our upswing in the business cycle. We have customers that are willing and wanting to spend. So we have new demands. And sometimes what will happen is we'll have a government stimulate the economy um, through increased spending. Uh, oftentimes this is done with war. Okay, then at the very top, we have prosperity. This is the highest point of our business cycle. We've got great employment, high wages, and our profits are going to increase. And we have tons of consumer spending that is taking place and businesses are thriving. Unfortunately, what goes up must eventually come down. And then we are brought into a recession. This is the falling phase of our business cycle. And this means that uh, we've got employ unemployment that is rising and business are beginning to fail, which means consumers are spending less. Now, a government will then intervene and begin to regulate the economy to, de to prevent a deep depression. And that's when the government will typically intervene. And if a government is intervening, are they shifting right or are they shifting left? If you remember from the previous lesson, it'll be a shift to the left. All right, what I want you to do is head over to your notebooks and complete the questions for this part of the chapter.